Oh, that sounded pretty nice. <laughs> oh, did it? On my end, it sounded bad. <laughs> oh, sorry. I was talking about my clap. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Michael's like, man, my claps are so great. Great night. <laughs> All right, you guys ready to start this? Absolutely. Hey, everybody. This is Tara, and welcome to another episode of Where Do the Meeples Go? A board gaming podcast. This is episode two The Terrible Twos. With me today is Phil. Hi. And Michael. Hey, gang. All right. So, what have you guys been playing? Yeah, so I'll go ahead and go first. Uh, I played a lot of games between our last recording sessions and this one. Uh, probably way too many to talk about in this little section, um, but I'll kind of hit some highlights and I'll get to others uh, in coming episodes because I do have a lot of thoughts on the games I played. Uh, I got to play Splendor again after kind of an unforced hiatus. I just hadn't gotten it to the table in a while. Still a great game. Love it. Still holds up. Can play it with anybody. Recommend it. Hardcore. Uh, got to play Abyss for the first time, and it blew my mind. I This is the game I... Really? Yeah, I loved it. I don't know why. It was nice and light and strategic, and I just want to play it again, because I want to try different strategies. Um, I went heavy on Mystics, I think, uh, the, purple, the purple ones, and I want to try some different strategies. So, loved it. Want to play it again. Yeah, I definitely want to check that one out again. I got to play it one time, and... Uh, I played it at a born gaming shop and just pulled it off the demo shelf. So we were kind of like fumbling through the game and then halfway sure. through we realized we were playing it wrong. So I oh, need to no. get it to the table again. Yeah, it's uh, artwork and it is fantastic. It's it's beautiful. Definitely. And it's Bruno Cathala. I'm a big fan of his. Oh, yeah. Always makes great games. And then the other game I played was Istanbul. It's interesting. I'm not sure my feelings on it. Isn't it, is it a heavier, like, strategic version of Splendor? Because that's kind of the impression I got. Uh, no. Uh, I wouldn't say <laughs> the two games are very similar. Sorry to shoot that down, but... <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> so basically, you're taking your merchant and his five, I believe it's five assistants, and going throughout the town of Istanbul trying to collect... Your ultimate goal is to get jewels, which those are kind of your win condition or victory points. Every time you drop somebody off you do that action that's on that tile. So I think the tea house, you gain a bunch of one resource and you can do a bunch of other things. But the problem is once you use your last assistant, you can't do those actions again unless you go pick them back up. So basically you have to kind of plan out your trip and then either okay. double double back or there's a square that allows you to get all your assistants back to one area. So you're trying to do that. There's a few different tiles that can give you those victory points. I don't know a good game to compare it to or that would give you a good idea of how it works. And maybe that's just my old my own ignorance of. It sounds you know, a little not... bit like five tribes. Because you kind of have to yeah. plan out your move, but it sounds like a yeah. more complicated move. Yeah, I think five tribes would be kind of a good way to describe it um you're always trying to go back though i guess that's one aspect of it is you're trying to find an optimal circle i guess is um kind of the guy the way the guys described it to me you're trying to find an optimal circle that you can kind of keep doing and keep getting victory points that way but yeah you uh (laughs) the merchant that you control he looks like he just ate a bowl of lemons for dinner he looks very sour (laughs) and (laughs) just i don't want to be here so it just kind of like defeats i don't know i saw that immediately and i was like oh i don't want to play as this guy can i get somebody else but they're all the same on every character or every color he's like a hard dealing kind of merchant yeah i guess so he just doesn't like his job or the city of istanbul so yeah that's what i played i played a game that a lot of people have probably played before a small world for for people who haven't played small world it's kind of like a little mini, I guess you could say war game, but more placement of tiles and things like that. But you kind of, you get your race and the attribute of that race that determines what their specialties are and different things like that. And you get different races throughout the game. And the person I played with had a house rule where you always get to make up the name 
or change the name of the attribute that your race has. Just kind of a fun thing. You just change the adjective to something else. And so we each had a little piece of tape that we put over our attribute. And as soon as everyone came back to the table, three out of the four people who were playing wrote naughty as their attribute, which is unfortunate. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so there's like naughty dwarves and uh, okay. all that stuff running around the board. It, I don't know. It's kind of a weird twist. It's fun, but I think it was funnier the fact that we had a couple beers beforehand. So <laughs> probably, probably not the one that is as great in the light of day. But another, another game that I played recently is uh, Sheriff of Nottingham, which I hadn't played before. And I actually really liked. It's uh, kind of a quick little bluffing game. And I don't normally use the the term torrid love affair, but I think I had one with this game for a little bit. I, I really got behind it, and I enjoyed it a lot. And it's, I don't know, I think it's something about the idea that you uh, get to lie a little bit about it, so you bring in your own... Did, did you get did you get any day. contraband through, or did you play truthful the whole game? Uh, I got some contraband through. My problem was that as the sheriff, I opened the bags every single time uh, <laughs> because I just wanted to. Yeah, it just feels good, and it did not work out in the end. I think I lost every game, but it was if it, the the power trip is really what the game's about, though. So yeah, I, I think played I with that my I played with my siblings, and it just didn't matter what I said, they were just going to pop my bag open every time. So I was just like, <laughs> forget it. I'm just going to be truthful every time. <laughs> we actually played this together um, this past weekend, Michael and I did. And um, International Tabletop Day was this past weekend. So we were playing quite a few games and we broke it out probably mid-evening, played one game and kind of moved on to something else. No, we played probably played two back to back. Moved on to another game and as we finished that one, it was a about ready to pack up and start leaving. Michael was like, uh, do you guys want to play another game of Sheriff? And I think we played two more games after that. So cool. I can vouch for Michael's love affair of this game. Ah, uh, yes. So we got to check out the Night Witches RPG, which is by the same guy that did Fiasco. It uh, recently had a Kickstarter campaign that did fairly well. I'm not a big RPG person. I've, I've played Pathfinder. I definitely like D&D. I've never actually played it. So this was this was interesting, and we um, our our buddy Sam just moved to Texas, so he he came over, and I got to see firsthand what Sam is like. <laughs> he he was totally cool. Uh, we enjoyed it. And Night Witches, you play a all female night bombing regiment in World War II in Russia, which sounds pretty heavy, but this game did a really good job of kind of holding your hand through RPG if you're not really big into like making characters and stuff. And it did a really good job of like prompting scenarios for, for people to act out, which I appreciated because I'm, I'm not really able to initiate those things myself. But the game did a really good job of kind of guiding you through that. Now, do you have to have a GM for this game? You do, but it every time you guys have a session, it rotates, basically. So oh, one person cool. GMs, and then the next session, another person does it. That's so great, because there's people that get stuck as kind of the forever GMs. They never get to play, and yeah, it's kind of cool that the game has a system where you get to rotate that and make sure everybody gets a chance to be the Night Witches. Exactly. One one of the funny things that ended up happening was so in your your character sheet, you have a couple of different like um, uh, background things you get to like choose and it gives you a couple of like suggestions. You don't have to pick them. You can write your own. But if you're new to it and need help, it, it kind of gives you some suggestions. So one of the things on the background, the question was, who do you write back home to? And so it gives you a couple of prompts or whatever. And the uh, character sheet that my friend got one of his options was your dead husband and so he obviously picks <laughs> your dead husband Sorry. and it just <laughs> I guess I should also mention that um, each instead of having classes you're a type of bird and that's like your class and that kind of determines like the personality you have and like your role within the regiment and so each character sheet had a different type of bird and different types of personalities. So my friend was the owl. And so he wrote home to his dead husband and it became this like joke 
that he would be writing to his dead husband all the time. And at one point, we're all sitting in the mess hall eating, and he's, like, writing to his dead husband. He's supposed to be really smart because he's an owl, but Sam, like, rolled, like, a a sleight of hand and, like, took the paper from him, but he doesn't know that the paper's gone, so he's just, like, writing on the table. <laughs> <laughs> really? That's so cool. And then a- after we do a couple of missions, uh, we have our planes and whatnot. They end up naming the plane My Dead Husband. <laughs> <laughs> so the whole time we're just referring to My Dead Husband. <laughs> oh, so it's so are much they fun. still writing letters, but to their plane now? Exactly. Um. Phil, serenade us with this next topic. (laughs) Let me finish this bottle of wine and maybe. (laughs) It's like a quarter of the way down. So, intros. Today we're going to be talking about games that drive you crazy. Now, this can be crazy in any sense, whether it's you can't win the game, you just have to have the game, whatever. A game that just draws you in and you fixate upon that game for however long. So, Michael, why don't you go ahead and tell us a game that made you crazy in recent history? Sure. Hands down for me, this game is The Resistance. Uh, For anyone who hasn't played it, it's a little bit like Mafia, which is probably a little bit more common. Uh, It's where you'll have two sides, and you don't know who's on which side. The evil people will know who's on their team, but the, the good side won't know who the evil people are. And you're basically trying to sniff out who these betrayers are before the end of the game and in this case they call those betrayers spies and every time i play this game because it's random i have never once been one of the spies but no one ever believes me and you would think at least in this case gambler's fallacy would be on my side it just never happens so for example last time i played i was on the good side and i knew or i had figured out who else is on the side with me and I was pleading my case. I was trying to bribe the people on my own team to try and believe me and take me on the mission with them. And it just never happens. <laughs> and then the next game, it just happened all over again. It was, it was super frustrating, but uh, I, don't, I don't know if either of you have played it, but it's, oh, yeah. it's one of those games that for me, it just, I don't know, maybe it's my personality that I'm like so obstinate about the fact that I am like good, that people just be like, this guy has to be lying his butt <laughs> off. But I don't know. Are you a good liar, Michael? Really? I, f- I feel like I'd be good. At- I can. I guess I never know because I never get the opportunity to lie. It's. I thought this was America, <laughs> but apparently not. Nope, this is not America. <laughs> this is the resistance. No. I, yeah, I, I don't know. I feel like I could be good at lying, but maybe I'm just not good at telling the truth. I don't know. Now, have you uh, have you ever played with like the Avalon version of this game? I have. They they have the uh, couple other things in there as well, like the Merlin. And everything like that, right? Yeah, yeah it's, it's interesting. Yeah, so they add some different roles to it. Um, like, I think one of them is Percival, uh, where you actually switch sides middle of the game. So I, th- I think that's how it works. You can either start off evil, and then halfway through the game you switch to good, or the other way around. So it kind of always keeps people guessing with it. Now, this isn't, this isn't a game I've played before. Um, it's always been one i've wanted to play um i take that back i actually played one game but we were playing with a new guy and he didn't understand that if you were a good player you couldn't lie about being a spy which why anybody would want to lie about it i'm not sure he just kind of didn't understand the concept and it was quickly passed over and moved on to another game understandable in that situation it makes the game harder to play but I don't know. It's it's one of those things. I guess maybe you just felt left out about not being able to, you know, mix it up with the rest of them. Now, this game uh, is actually coming out with kind of a new version of it. Yeah. In the same vein of One Night Ultimate Werewolf, where it tries to boil this game of lying and bluffing over several rounds and kind of deduction into one playthrough where there's one spy, there's several different roles, um, special abilities and such. And so I think it's called One Night... Ult- Is it just One Night Resistance? Yes. Yeah, One Night Resistant. Yeah, One Night... One Night Thing You Do. <laughs> one Night... The board game. <laughs> one Night Thing You Do. 
<laughs> Insert title here. <laughs> yeah. I really enjoyed the uh, One Night Ultimate Werewolf series. It it definitely creates a lot of confusion in the game versus the um, just regular Ultimate Werewolf series where you have time to like figure out you know who's lying and um, who's who's playing what roles. Whereas the One Night series, you don't get that opportunity. You just kind of have to like figure it out very quickly you have like a 10 minute timer and then you just go and you flip the cards over and you're usually wrong <laughs> but um so I'm, I'm curious how the resistance is going to be um in that version i've only played the resistance a few times i i prefer werewolf over resistance but mm. um i enjoyed the few times i did play resistance interesting and it seems like indie games has a good track record with these yeah. kind of bluffing games like Coup and Resistance and One Night and all those different ones. Yeah, Indie Board Games is the publisher of this. Yeah, so this game was on Kickstarter. Uh, we hope you guys backed it. Um, I know certainly a few of you guys probably did, didn't you? I'm planning on it. Not sure yet, though. Uh, I have not backed it but yet, it but I neat. start it. So when it's 48 hours away, I have to make that decision. <laughs> I see. Yeah, that's so how many... I roll on Kickstarter. <laughs> Forty-eight hours, and then you decide. So, what other games drive you two crazy? I can tell you about a game that did drive me crazy, and I kind of regret it now. Um, so back in two thousand, early two thousand fourteen, a game was coming out called Marvel Dice Masters X Men vs Avengers. Um, it's a game designed by Eric Lang, and it's kind of it's a collectible dice game and a kind of head-to-head battle. So this game was coming out. I read about it and I was like, "Oh, that sounds pretty cool. I might pick it up." And started seeing more stuff about it, more stuff, and I just fell in love with it. I love superheroes in general. Um, this one looked pretty awesome. They were having a few of my favorite characters in there. So I was like, yeah, this is a definite purchase. I think the starter pack is $15 and boosters are only $2 or a dollar, depending on where you're at. And so it's a definite buy for me. Only issue is the very first run had extremely limited copies. Like there was essentially a drought um, on this I think only major retailers got a few of theirs and like local game shops. I know several ones around me only got one copy when they were promised like seven or 10 of them. The reason I know, yeah, the reason I know that there are several game shops that got shorted is because I literally called everyone. I did a Google search for like comic book shops within oh. 75 miles. I think when I was getting really desperate. 75. Yeah. So 75 miles. Um, couldn't oh. find one really that was not selling it at a ridiculously high price. Um, seeing prices at like $40 and stuff like that when the normal retail is 15. Die. So yeah. Um, so that was kind of surrounding my life for about, you know, month, month and a half. Um, those happened to kind of coincide with the finals for my final year of college. So that went well. Um, <laughs> RIP, I could just GPA. Pi- I-, I could just picture <laughs> Phil like s- supposed to be like, he's in the library. He's supposed to be studying for mm-hmm. his exams. And he's just like yep. freaking out about these Marvel dice masters. <laughs> he's trying to take notes, but he can only keep writing dice, 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 <laughs> dice, dice masters, dice masters, dice masters. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of how it was. I was doing a lot of research, way more research than necessary. Um, I think like at one point Hastings had some on sale online and I was in a queue to get those like on their website or whatever. Didn't actually get it. Um, nearly threw my computer out the window. All those kind of fun things. Do you always throw your computer out the window, Phil? You said that <laughs> twice this time. Yeah, I go through about six computers a year. Do you guys not? Apparently, I need to be throwing my computers more. (laughs) Try not to. You got to teach them lessons. But eventually, in September of 2014, they released Marvel Uncanny X-Men. Again, the Dice Masters version of it. So it's just kind of new characters. Same system, new powers, new characters, new dice, all that kind of stuff. 
picked it up. I was able to actually get it. I pre-ordered it this time and they were able to better fulfill these. So I did get my copy and I'm kind of disappointed in it. Overall, oh, no. it, it's not a bad system. It's oh. just not the system for me. I think it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of tournaments popping up, and I know a lot of people have a ton of fun with it, and it's there's so you know, much it's been hype. A huge su- yeah, it's a huge success for them. Um, they've made Yu-Gi-Oh Dice Masters, uh, Justice League Dice Masters, Dungeons and Dragons Dice Masters, which I did pick up. Still disappointed. Um, re- retheming it did not help, kind of. Oh man, with my dislike of it. So I love the system. It's great. I might look into Quarriers, which is a non-collectible version, similar, very similar in kind of the play styles. But I heard that one has a little bit more stability to it. So that was my that was my quest to find Dice Masters. It's not a pretty chapter in my life. But all right, Phil. Jeez. Uh, it sounds like almost the intensity of. Magic the Gathering, Magic the Gathering dice, or something like that, where you just have to constantly keep updated with it. Is that is that the case? Do they come out with a lot of different booster packs, or is it just one one run and everyone has the same dice? Um, it's not. So there is kind of the rare chasing through the boosters where you'll get better cards or have the potential to get better cards. Um, it's not. They haven't gotten to the point where they've released the second series of kind of every branding. I'm sure there's rules where you can play across the brands, um, like DC to Marvel or Marvel to Dungeons and Dragons. I'm sure they have setups like that, and you can kind of easily do it with the rules, how they're laid out. But they haven't released the second series of them, so it's not like, oh, you need to update yours to play in a tournament. When they have a Dice Masters tournament, I assume they're doing like, they're calling out which core set they're playing with. Oh, uh, Magic the Gathering is pretty a good a pretty good analogy for this. Um, yeah, it's blowing up for them. They've been selling really well, and hopefully it can keep up. Because um, I know those games like Dice Mass or um, Magic the Gathering are real helps for local comic book shops because they keep people in. Yeah, Board with Life did a really great bit about Marvel Dice Masters last year. Mm-hmm. <laughs> where like Chris is like walking through a back alley and Donald like pops out in a trench coat and looks super sketchy and he like opens up his jacket and he's got all these like Marvel's Dice Master yeah. stuff. <laughs> it's really good. You should check it out. And it's kind of funny because Chris is like pretty apprehensive about actually starting these. Whereas if I was in that bit, I would be tackling Donald and stealing everything he had because I wanted that so bad. Oh. Oh, That's by the rough. way, I still don't have the original set that I wanted. Oh, no. I've just got... <laughs> so maybe my quest is oh, over, man. but it's been put on hold. No. What was the set? Uh, X-Men vs. Avengers, or the other way around. X-Men and, A- X-Men and Avengers together, because, yeah, I think they left out Ant-Man, which is unfortunate because he's my favorite, but I looked past it. He's a founding member of the Avengers, isn't he? Yeah, uh, Ant Man is a founding member of the Avengers, and the creator of Ultron. Oh man, that's mm-hmm. that's just no way to treat an elder. That's unfortunate. Ant Man was kind of a jerk, though, from what I remember. Oh, he yeah. like he he goes batshit insane for a spell, but <laughs> I don't think Paul Rudd's going to be reprising that part. If of anybody it, <laughs> wants to get Phil a copy, tweet at us. And we'll get we'll get you an address. <laughs> yes. That make Phil so happy. I will cherish it. I will probably never play it, but I will cherish it. <laughs> <laughs> That's all that matters. Yeah. Uh, one of the games that has recently driven me crazy is Agricola. Uh, this game came out in two thousand eight. Uh, UA Rosenberg, I believe that's how you say his name. A very famous designer. This is a heavy, heavy worker placement. I would say it's um, definitely one of the iconic worker placements. And um, I, I just got sucked into it one day. I actually started playing the app on my phone. I, I had a few friends that had told me about it, but that game is expensive. It's like an $80 game. So I wanted to try it on the app first. 
and I had no idea what I was doing. And luckily, those iOS games are really good at the tutorial part of the game, which is I highly recommend that versus reading a 30 page rule book because <laughs> you're just not going to pick it up. But um, so I started playing that against the computer and I, oh gosh, it's just so heavy and you don't really get to move very far. And that's kind of um, something I've noticed in worker placements. Either you, you can score a lot of points really quickly or you can score very little. It's one or the other. It's never like in the middle. So some games you can score like 100 points. And then this game, it's like, I'm lucky if I get 12 points. So in Agricola, you play as farmers and you're trying to build up your house and raise livestock and grow vegetables. And you only have a limited amount of things you can do per turn. Every round, the, ga- the, the turns that you can have become shorter and shorter before the harvest phase. And the harvest phase is um, where like your livestock breed or you get vegetables but then after all of that happens, you have to feed your workers. And if you don't have enough food to feed your workers, you get beggar's cards. And those are where the negative points come in. And that's what was getting me in Agricola. No matter how hard I tried, I could not get all of those things in one turn. But the computer was so good at stacking those combos. It was just like my mind was blown. I was every morning I would play this game before work and I would just be pulling out my hair. I just could not understand how the computer could do what it did. So that was definitely the game that drove me crazy. I still love the game, but oh, gosh. Even thinking about it right now, I think the most uh, points I've ever gotten in that game is like 18 points. Wow. So, And everything ends up... Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, this is an, it has an engine building component to it as well, correct? It's not just straight worker placement? What do you mean by engine building? Like you can kind of play off each other, where, or um, sorry, your resources can play off of it. Um, so say you harvest corn, well, you can use that corn to feed your cows and then your cows can feed you so in the version of the game that i was playing you don't actually have to feed like your animals or anything but you for instance like if i have a fence that only fits it only fits like four uh animals and i know that they're gonna breed anyway i can use one of them to like feed my uh feed my workers and then i'll end up getting it back when they breed Mm. or whatever but then there's also like, um, for instance, you can grow wheat and you can use that wheat to bake bread and you can use that to feed your workers as well. Okay. And, and there's a lot of different versions of this game. It's got a few expansions that I haven't um, tried out yet. But um, the base game was just enough to <laughs> make my brain hurt every morning. But I really love the game. I just wish I was better at it. <laughs> Well, you just got to keep playing that app. And I would say don't feel yeah. too bad losing to a computer because it's a computer specifically designed to play that game. So I think... And they're obviously really good at it. Yeah, exactly. It's doing its job. The, that's the big thing with board game apps. I I feel like kind of nerdy talking about playing these board game apps by myself in my room, but I do sometimes. And they all kind of set these either impossible goals where it's like score a thousand points in one round so you can never actually get the trophies for the games or they make the AI for it incredibly hard. Uh, I think the the Catan one was pretty straightforward, but there's been some other ones where I'm just like, wow, this is the most <sighs> well, see, depressing game I've ever played. The opposite of that is, uh, for me at least, is Ticket to Ride because I just wreck in that game. I'm so good at like the app version not so great oh yeah i love the app not so great with the normal one like i can still do decent you think all the training quote unquote i would do on the app would translate not so much that's actually the one i was talking about in terms of the uh the impossible trophies though because i think that's the one that you have to have on a continuous route that's just ridiculously long or all these other things that are just like so hard to reach but i mean the the game is, is it's really fun but it's just I'm just imagining the guy who plays these games and can reach those goals is just got to be yeah. <laughs> the next chess master or something. I don't know. So since we were kind of talking about 
um, apps on board games. And you, had, Michael, you had mentioned Catan. Um, Catan actually is one of the games that drives me crazy, um, or has been, because I played a six-player game close to about a year ago, and it soured me on the experience. It took way too long. It was, I actually got kind of edged out where I couldn't move past my two starting positions. Uh, Everybody built roads and settlements and blocked me in, and unfortunately, I didn't have a great position on those two already. I think I maybe built, I was able to build one more settlement, but overall I was locked in, and it was pretty much impossible to actually win the game in that amount of time before somebody else won. Yeah, you can get the victory points through development cards, but... It's just not enough. I didn't have a great position. And so overall, it took us probably two and a half hours once it's all said and done, which is way longer than any Canton game should last, in my opinion. And so it drove me crazy for a long time where I just didn't want to play it. I'm still kind of apprehensive on whether I want to play it again. And maybe I'm just... I don't want to sound too pretentious about this, but over Catan as a game, it's a great game for what it is. And if you've got new people that are still really apprehensive to board games, you can think of Catan, but there are some other great ones out there that I would maybe consider before that one. Yeah. For those of you who are, who are newer to the hobby, Settlers of Catan is usually the one that, that people talk about as far as newer board games that aren't Monopoly that a lot of people have tried. I've played this game once and I'm maybe because I had played it later on and being invested in the hobby that I kind of stuck my nose up to it a little bit, but I can understand it's kind of a founding father. I feel like in the, the hobby because a lot of games take from what that game did. So I appreciate it for that. Oh yeah. And it's one of those games. I mean, you can find it in Walmart. You can find it in Toys R Us, Target, everywhere that... You know, it's right up there with the Monopolies and Saris and Candylands of the world. But it actually is for, you know, being that popular and being considered an intro and family game. Great game. But I really liked um, they did Catan Jr. on tabletop this season. I thought that was really cool. Oh, really? Hmm. I thought it, it, they kind of play as pirates. So I was like, oh, that's kind of a cute theme for for that game. I I might actually play that with my cousins. Oh, that's nice. Hmm. And, you know, I. For me, Catan was uh, one of the first games I really got into besides, you know, the typical ones. But I think I had the same experience in terms of getting kind of tired of it. And I think it's just the quantity, the amount of times I played it became overwhelming. But the one thing I do appreciate is the fact that they have a lot of different variances within their franchise and they're actually pretty they have some pretty cool ones like they have ones that change the rules there's just different resources you're not even really focusing on settling a land area anymore you're like out to the sea fishing different things like that and uh there's also i think it's called settlers of america something like that where they do this cool little system where as you move west across the united states the resources from the east end of the united states start to deplete so you'll pick up the chips that you would normally roll for there and move them to the west side as you start to settle that area. So it kind of it stops anyone from gaining that empire that Phil's was talking to Phil's talking about where you get blocked mm-hmm. in because if they have an empire in the east, that's gonna go away. So that if they focus all the resources there, they're gonna get overrun later. Uh, so I think that's cool that they've been doing different things like that. But I, I can totally understand the idea that it's kind of and just one of those games that a lot of people get into early on and just play so much and or that if you've played other variants of games like it it's kind of the vanilla version of it almost yeah and maybe it's a matter of playing those expansions for me to get me back on the bandwagon or you know back in the corner of Catan because I haven't played any uh we played a six player game which I guess is the five to six player expansion but really all that does is just add more tiles and more resource cards so not a true expansion in that kind of sense so Tara why don't you go ahead and tell us about your experiences with uh Sherlock Sherlock Holmes consulting detective okay the first time I heard about this game, um, one of my coworkers had gone to BGG Con, and 
BGG Con is a, a local uh, board gaming convention in Dallas, Texas, Board Game Geek, where you just play games. It, it's a really good place if you don't have a board gaming group or to try out a new game that you don't have access to. And so while all of our friends were at BGG Con trying out all these new games, my friend Brian was all alone at a table playing Sherlock Holmes Consulting <laughs> Detective. And he played it the entire weekend. Really? <laughs> By himself. <laughs> so when he told me about this, I was just like, what? <laughs> how, how is that possible? How did you play a board game by yourself all weekend? And then he pulled out his copy, which is an older copy from the 80s. And he, he started to explain to me what Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective was. Basically, this this game is a lot different from the typical board games that we're playing right now. There's not a lot of components. It's mostly paper. So you have a map of London. You have a bunch of different newspapers from different time periods. You have a, a phone directory. And then you have um, different booklets for each scenario. And the most recent copy um, that has been on and off of Amazon for months now probably due to the fact that Shut Up and Sit Down named this in their, I think it was their top five board games of all time. It's probably why this game has been so hard to find recently. So in Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, you're basically trying to solve a case, but you're also trying to solve it faster than Sherlock Holmes, which in theory seems possible, but you kind of have to go into this game knowing that you can't beat Sherlock Holmes. The guy is Sherlock Holmes. He's going to solve it way better and way faster than you. So you just go in and enjoy the game. So the first time I played the game, I was at home by myself. Should definitely get you some bourbon <laughs> or a nice beer or whatever you want to drink because you're going to be here for a while. Just sit back and enjoy that drink and start reading the case file. Definitely have a pen and paper while you play as well because... I was just covering sheets and sheets of paper of notes and all of these things. The game does a really good job of streamlining how to solve a mystery, but also giving you tidbits that make your mind just go crazy and start thinking about all these scenarios that could possibly happen through, oh, well, I went to this location and such and such said this, which made me think, oh, well, maybe I should go to this location and see what such and such says. So you go to that location and you get nothing of interest. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a waste. So the goal of the game oh. is to solve the mystery in fewer steps than Sherlock Holmes. But these weird tangents will, you'll end up like going to five or six different locations only to find out that your lead was a total bust. Which, even though it was frustrating... It was still really enjoyable to be like, man, I solved this mystery, kind of. <laughs> I figured out who did it, but I don't know his motive. <laughs> Clearly, I'm wrong, but that was really fun. I'll definitely try that again. And I think it's a really good couples game, too, if, if you're hanging out with your significant other and looking for something to do. It, it was a lot fun to play as a team, or you could also play against each other as well. I think this game um, has unlimited amount of players that you can have so you can play it as a group or you can play by yourself which i thought was really cool so if you can get yourself a copy check it out spend a weekend with yourself and probably drink a lot of booze and go crazy but it'll be fun now can you yeah can you play this game like well you mentioned there's different cases and it comes with five is that correct it comes with ten 10 okay i was gonna say so you can really only play each case one time yeah you know, even if you're playing with a different group of people you know how it ends and you know there's no way to kind of play it but i guess with 10 playthroughs and you probably imagine i would imagine you take a whole night to do just one case is that right oh yeah okay uh it, it probably takes I'd say two to four hours, depending on how heavy you're playing into it. You could like, it's one of those games in which you can't really do this a lot with board games. You set it down and then come back a few hours later and pick it back up again. So there's not really any, there's not any components other than the paper and your notes 
So there's not a lot of cleanup either, which is nice. I kind of like to see almost just a, a mob of people playing it. I would really like to play this on the show. And different things like that. I don't know how we would do that, but it would be kind of hilarious. I think it would be kind of cool. Like if, uh, <laughs> I guess since you own the game, you could maybe read us some stuff like, uh, have the directory and all that kind of stuff. But we would, yeah. uh, you know, try to, I think that'd be really cool. I think we should definitely give that a shot sometime trying to play this all together. I've only played yeah. two cases, so I've got eight more to go. Oh, nice. <laughs> now, I would like to mention there is a game similar to this if you can't find it, because we will get to uh, kind of the price point and everything, talk about that in a second. Um, there's a game called Arkham Investigators, which goes along the same vein as this, where it's similar to the Consulting Detectives, but rather being set in England, it's actually sent set in lovecraftian new england and it's set in the cthulhu universe so that sounds rather awesome and somebody just got murdered um maybe it's cthulhu is rising and you have to figure out which cult is bringing him about so it's uh, actually free um if you do a search for arkham investigator on board game geek you can find the files there and it's similar it's got a directory and all that kind of stuff that it comes with so definitely check that out cool Am I possibly right in assuming this is the same people that do Arkham Horror and Eldritch Horror? Uh, no, that's Fantasy Flight. This is, uh, I think it's an independent publisher, which I, I, yeah, I regret that I do not know who it actually is by. Um, yeah, we can just cut this whole part out. <laughs> oh, no, I want to tell. <laughs> um, one second. I am looking. You know, Phil... Yeah. You know what else is kind of like set in a Lovecraftian universe with the kind of the edgy investigative theme, right? Where you don't have a lot of clues, but you're trying to figure things out. Phil's day job. Phil's day job. <laughs> and the bottle's Woo. empty. All right. Um, Did you ever find the publisher for that uh, Arkham Investigators game? <laughs> yes. Yes. I, yes, I have it. I can multitask. Yeah, so if this sounds interesting to you, but you guys can't find a version of it on the internet um, for purchase or at your local game store for purchase, go ahead and if you like uh, Cthulhu-themed stuff, um, go ahead and check out Arkham Investigators. It's by Hal Eccles. I believe it's Eccles. I hope it is, at least. Um, It's a similar game to... Sherlock Holmes consulting detective, but it's set in the Lovecraft universe back in the 1930s, 1920s ish. And yeah, you'll just try to solve crimes that may not just be about straight up murder. It could be about a cult trying to awaken old ones, but it's uh, for free. It's print and play. I believe they have three cases out as it stands now. So I'd say check that out. So speaking of Sherlock Holmes consulting detective, Uh, We wanted to talk about a few games tonight that are too hot for Amazon. Games that are currently sold out on Amazon and private sellers are selling them for a little bit higher than what you should be paying. So if you're new to the board gaming hobby and a friend has told you about a game and you go on Amazon and you see, ooh, that's $90, is that worth buying? We're here to tell you that you should go buy local. And the first game is actually Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective. That one, as I said, was constantly being in and out of stock. Uh, Usually retails for about $30. I think it's on Amazon right now for $50. So if you can, find it local. Somebody want to take the next one? Yeah, so uh, Dead of Winter, it's currently around $86. It normally retails for around $45 to $50. Um, now when this game first came out and there's a ton of hype about it, I saw it on Amazon and eBay for around $150, which is ridiculously Dang. high. I can't think of a game that's worth 150 bucks. Okay. So, uh, another one, uh, that is really popular, similar to Agricola, Stone Age. That one usually retails for about 40 bucks. So, um, try and find it local. Don't spend the 60 or. Er, Oh, it's on Amazon for 90 Yeah, definitely don't buy that on Amazon. You can, um, most of these games can be attributed to either Shut Up and Sit Down covering them, 
or tabletop doing episodes on those. Um, and exactly. it's nothing against, the, against those guys because they do great content and great coverage of board games. But once people see those, they buy them all up. Um, not, you know, one person buying a ton of copies, but um, just people want to actually play the games that they've seen on those sites. So um, I know Rex, which is a game set in the Twilight Imperium universe, normally retails for around $40. It's $80 on Amazon. Um, I think this has been out of print for a while, so hopefully your local game store has it, but check it out. And then an, another one that I've been hearing a lot about but I haven't actually seen is the D&D 5E Spellbook cards. They don't even have these on Amazon right now. There's not even a place for them. So if you find them at a local retailer, please take a picture uh, tweet it at us. Let us know where you got it at. Yep. And uh, one game that isn't too hot for Amazon, it's just really expensive, is uh, Dawn, Rise of the Occultiles. And I truthfully can't speak about this too much, except for I do know that the unpainted version of this, the retail is $174. And the, the painted version is two hundred and seventy four dollars. Um, at least Dang. that's what it was on Cool Stuff Inc., which usually has lower prices than pretty much anywhere else. Don't know about this game. It does come with a ton of minis. They look really interesting because they're all kind of eyeball based. But maybe look into it if it jives with you and you want to get it. Look at it. But one hundred seventy four dollars. Unless I hear it's, yeah, unless I hear it's amazing, I think yeah. it's a uh, pass for me. Again, if uh, any of you guys find these at your local game shop, tweet at us at Meeples Go and uh, send us a picture. Let us know what you got. Oh, wait, guys, wait. Saved by the Bell, Bayside High School, board game. Wait, are you, out. are you serious? It's on Kickstarter. That's a thing. I swear to God. $75,000 is their goal. <gasps> Seven days to get seven days to go. One backer has pledged one dollar. Oh, well, that's that's why. Uh, the only reward reward tier is a hundred dollars or more, and you'll get a t shirt and a mug from Bayside. You don't get the board game. Nope. Okay, this has got to be a joke. See, this is what <laughs> happens with cones of Dunshire. Yeah. That they did not know how to do the Kickstarter thing, and it just kind of backfired. So you don't even get the game. Breaking news: You can't put your wildest dreams forward as your first, your first iteration. Yeah. Okay, yeah, this has got to be a joke. Yeah. This is not serious. There's nothing in this about section except for no. Basically, they tell you about the board game. Um telling you that it touches on serious social issues such as drug abuse drinking driving under the influence homelessness remarriage death women's rights and environmental issues and then under that this is a bit under that this game is going to be epic <laughs> so yeah i see when i do my kickstarter searches i see a lot of games that are just like Hey, I thought it would be cool to make a game about my high school. Do you like high school? Well, I do too. Let's make the game. And there's just like no pictures or video or anything. It's just text. And just so, yeah, that is uh, that's out there. That's not real. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're gonna eat your words when that one gets funded in like a day. seven days. Only seven thousand seven seventy four thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars to go. <laughs> So a random piece of gaming news that came across lately is the fact that a lot of designers have gotten together under the the umbrella of one major project called the Titan series, which is now available on Kickstarter. And it's a series of games that will be published by Calliope Games, is I believe how you say it. And it will be over the course of the next three years, nine different designers who are really well known, like Eric Lang... The Wisemans, uh, Paul Peterson, Richard Garfield, different designers like that will be creating their own game and sending out three a year over the next three years to all of the backers 
Now, we don't know exactly what those games are yet. We have an idea, if you go to that Kickstarter page, of what the games will be about for the first year. And then after that, you're kind of putting your faith in the fact that these are well-decorated designers who are making these games. Um, but they have different different levels of pledging you can put there if you want just uh, one game by itself or all nine games over the course of the next few years. That's up to you. But I think it's worth checking out just because of the people that are involved in it. Yeah, so I'm I'm kind of on the fence about this series as an overall kind of being. Um, I love the idea of getting all these great designers to make the games that they want to make in a genre that they want to make. Um, maybe ones that they aren't explicitly known for. My issue here is the stretch goals. So most games, when they handle the stretch goals, they get more component or better components more expansions possibly free expansions um with this one you really just get additional games that can either be substituted or added on now i really hope that the publishers come out with great components for it initially um then i'd be kind of more on board with it but i haven't seen anything from them in regards to the components of these things what I'm hoping these games do is have retailers pick them up, and I'm sure there pe- there will will be people or uh, retailers that do pick it up, and maybe I'll pick up a few games I want there. But as it stands now, I'm kind of I'm still on the fence. I'll give it like Tara said, 48 hours before it's funded. And I, I'll see I, if I like actually it. was pretty on the fence myself when I first saw it, just because of the fact. I think most mainly for me, it's the fact that you're not receiving the last game until three years from now, which is seems like a long ways away and if you're not exactly sure where you're going to be three years from now. Um, but for me, the other thing I had an issue with is I wasn't sure how much time these designers would have because they have other projects going on. But at the same time, they're also names that will be in the spotlight. So they a lot hinges on them releasing quality games. And I do have, I do have a little bit of faith in that idea that they won't put their name on something that's not of good quality. So I don't, I don't foresee that being any, really really lustrous components but it's definitely i think something that will be will hold up against time different things like that and i i also uh, imagine that this 16 dollars per game or so right now is going to be quite a bit under retail value later and that's kind of why i'm jumping at it now rather than seeing later but again it's one of those things where from person to person it might vary depending on what your outlook on it is Tara, do you have any thoughts Not on the really. Titan series? Um, I mean, it looks interesting. Uh, the concept is definitely um, new and different. But I'll, I'm not a huge fan of any of the designers. I, you know, I, I know Richard Garfield because of he is he with Magic? Did he do something with Magic? Yep, he did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Magic and um, King of Tokyo, King of New York, all of that. But n- none of the designers are anybody that I'm huge fans of. So. I'm definitely keeping my eye out on it just in case there's a game that's really exciting. But right now I'm just not interested. It seems like we hit basically all three levels of interest in terms of this one. Any Anytime there's a, something a, yeah. of controversy <laughs> or discussion, all three of us are all on different uh, ends of the spectrum. And that's how good teamwork <laughs> starts. Yeah. Yep. Well, thank you guys for listening to another episode of Where Do the Meeples Go? As always, you can email us at meeplesgo at gmail.com, or you can find us on Twitter at meeplesgo. Um, you can find our hosts individually. I'm at Canada underscore Philip. Philip is with two L's. I'm at the Feisty Taco, E before I and Feisty. I'm at Tara underscore underscore T-E-A. Our music was kindly done by Katie Brooking. All right. Thanks, everybody, and we'll see you again soon. Bye. Oh god. Cut, cut. Or oh, never mind. Okay, just don't use that portion of Let me I don't want that in there. Um <clears throat> Take it down a notch though. <laughs> yeah, sorry. It's this wine. I'm getting mad about my board games because of why. We said we'd be positive, you jerk! Board game rage!
<laughs> I know. I'm going against everything I hate. <laughs> <laughs> the mission statement, Phil. The mission statement. <laughs> the mission statement. Oh, this one. Wouldn't it be crazy? Wouldn't it be crazy if I had it tattooed on my arm? <laughs> and you start like crossing it out. No. <laughs> this is this is what you want. Just if you get the one that, as it is tattooed on your arm, I'll give you all my board games from the Titan series. <laughs> If we ever do like a Patreon or a Kickstarter, that is our stretch goal. No, Phil gets tattooed. No, gets a mission tattooed no on there him. are people that would fund that, and I would hate it's that. It's fine, Phil. No, Phil, before the hand, beforehand, before we release that, we'll change the mission statement to just butts. So it's totally fine. Butts. That's not better. Meeple's Go is a podcast, butts. <laughs>